Good evening. So good to see you. This year, uh, I wanted to go on to a little bit of PowerPoint, but I have to tell you that I'm a technological troglodyte. <laughs> but we just put our screens in this past year, and we wanted to use them for some teaching. And uh, so I finished my thing, and I gave it to someone to put it in PowerPoint because I don't know how to do it. I'll hopefully learn but I didn't know that it was so complicated. So we, we got about two thirds of the night on it. it. Depends on how far we'll go on the tonight. We can always pick it up in the next one in the next session at the end of March. But uh, if I get further along, uh, you'll just have to follow me without the PowerPoint. And it's my fault, not the other guy's fault, but I'm delighted. You know, I've been doing this course for quite a while, for a few years on uh, myths about the Catholic Church called myth busting. And the reason is it's amazing how much false information or lack of information people have about the Catholic Church. And I thought this would be a good way to address a lot of the objections, attacks on, the, on our faith or questions that we have. So this year I thought I'd do one on the myths about the papacy. And I stole Patrick Madrid's words, the title of his book, called Pope Fiction. So we're going to cover a lot of different myths about the papacy. And basically, you know, the myths about the papacy, they really fall under two categories. Papal primacy was Peter the first among the apostles. And papal infallibility, was he given a special authority by our Lord Jesus? Almost every myth really about the papacy falls under those two categories or is a variant of the two. Tonight, I'd like to uh, begin with the first pope, Peter, because many of the myths start, uh, of the papacy start with him. And the reason why, because the enemies or the skeptics of the church believe that they can invalidate the first pope, Peter, then everything else about the papacy falls apart. You know, the summary of these uh, myths about Peter could be something like this. St. Peter had no special authority. He was not the first pope. He didn't have any special primacy or jurisdiction over the other apostles. Jesus didn't want to build his church on St. Peter. Jesus wanted to build his church on himself, the true rock of faith. This is often called the Petros Petra argument. We'll get to it in a few minutes. And if Jesus made St. Peter the first pope, then why did Jesus call him Satan in Matthew 6, 23? Doesn't that disprove it? In fact, also, St. Peter denies that he has special primacy when Peter refers to himself in 1 Peter 5, 1 as a fellow presbyter. That's an office more than even the bishop, the episcopos. If anything, St. Paul had a greater authority than St. Peter because he rebuked him in Galatians 2, 11, 13. And finally, St. Peter did not have any successors. You know, although St. Peter doesn't call himself Pope in the scriptures, that's true. He did have special apostolic primacy and jurisdiction. And this scriptural and historical evidence of this claim, it's overwhelming and very explicit. But before we get into that, I just kind of like to take a little journey about this wonderful man, this incredible guy named St. Peter. We know some of the story, but I'd like to kind of review it. You know, St. Peter's story begins with an unusual conversation with Jesus along the Sea of Galilee when Jesus beckons Peter and his companions, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And then we know it ends very painfully on a cross some 30 years later, a thousand miles away from Israel, in a Roman arena. Now the scriptures tell us a lot about St. Peter, the kind of man he was. He was a Galilean fisherman with a hot-headed, impulsive personality. After Jesus called him for three years, St. Peter traveled with Jesus during Jesus' public ministry. He shared the hardships and the triumphs of Jesus' ministry. He heard the gospel preached directly from Jesus' mouth. I just think, imagine, Seen him sitting there hearing those beautiful words of the Sermon on the Mount. He was there and all the teachings. 
He witnessed Jesus' great miracles, and he himself, along with the other apostles, performed miracles that Jesus commands, as Luke 10, 5 to 19 tell us. With James and John, his, uh, his companions, his uh, former partners, uh, St. Peter was present at significant miracles in Jesus' life. For example, the raising of the dead daughter of Jairus. And then again, it was Peter, James, and John at the Transfiguration. He was at the Last Supper when Jesus washed Peter and the other apostles' feet. And a little later at that same supper, he watched Jesus celebrate the very first Eucharist. And he heard Jesus command Peter and the other apostles, now you do this in memory of me. Later that night, we know that he slept while Jesus asked him to watch and pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when Judas and the temple soldiers came forward to arrest him, the other guys were running, but not Peter. He drew his sword and he attacked the, the people. He rushed to defend his friend Jesus. But sadly, that very same night, as we know in the scriptures, despite his objection at the Last Supper, Peter's fears overwhelmed him and he abandoned his master, just as the sorrowful mystery of his passion was beginning. And again, despite professing his absolute faith in Jesus at the Last Supper, that he would never, ever, the rest will do it, but not me. I won't betray you, Jesus. Well, later that night, we know under oath in the courtyard of Caiaphas, the high priest, he denied even knowing Christ then preferring to hide in the shadows while his friend was being interrogated, tortured, and then ultimately executed. But the good news is after his resurrection, we know that Jesus, the scripture said, appeared first to Peter, then to the other apostles. Then, as Jesus promised, he was imbued with the very special grace of God that caused him to leave behind all that cowardice. Then we go through the book of Acts. It records that St. Peter became exactly what Jesus had predicted, that rock of faith on which Jesus would build his church and the apostle that Jesus always wanted to be, that courageous, humble, unswervingly dedicated uh, person to the apostle of Jesus. In Acts 1, Simon Peter, we see, rallies all the other apostles and leads them in taking the first step along the path of what we call apostolic succession, that Jesus meant for his power and authority and mission and ministry to go on, even not just with the apostles, but even beyond them. And we find that as they choose Matthias to pl- replace the traitor Jewis, Judas who had committed suicide. She continued through the Acts the Apostles in Acts 2. At Pentecost, it's Peter who explodes under the scene in a dazzle of zeal and incredible miracles. Beginning as we hear in Acts 2 with an incredibly penetrating sermon to all the crowds in Jerusalem on that day of Pentecost, where they said the people from all over the ancient world coming in different languages, they all understood Peter preaching. It was a sermon that reser- res- resulted in 3,000 conversions and 3,000 baptisms. I haven't preached like that, but he did. In Acts 15, at the Council of Jerusalem, we see the last glimpse of Peter in the scriptures. There he delivers an apostolic teaching at that assembly that literally stilled all the debates that were going back and forth that caused the whole, uh, and that decision was, we'll hear, that Gentiles were to be welcomed into the church, which was very, very Jewish Christian at that time. And what he said absolutely brought total silence to the crowd. Why do you say that? Because the Lord delivered a special revelation regarding the status of the Gentiles to Simon Peter in that beautiful vision where this, low, this blanket was lowered by the angels to him and on it was unclean food. And he heard the Lord say, there's nothing unclean. And he saw that as a sign that he was to welcome the Gentiles. And it was through uh, Peter that th- this revelation, I said, was given to the church at that council. And in that sense, what Peter was saying to the church at that council is, here is what we have to do, brothers. The Lord delivered the answer to me. Again, this preeminence of Peter. Now, at this point in the scriptures, the biblical narrative, St. Peter fades from our view. But tradition and history tell us that St. Peter 
an itinerant missionary who wandered through all the uh, ancient great cities of Rome preaching, eventually traveled to Rome where eventually he was arrested and he was convicted for being a Christian. And then he died in Rome, crucified upside down, was buried in a pagan cemetery nearby. By the way, in October, I went on the tour of the called the Scavi Tours. If you ever get to Rome, be sure to go on the Scavi Tours. It's the hottest ticket in Rome. You have to get online and order it because they only take about 11 people every day or two times a day through. You go way down into the ancient ancient necropolis that had been covered up when they built the original St. Peter's. And you walk through this ancient necropolis and they bring you around and show you how they discovered the tomb of Peter. But this remarkable man, he went from being a boisterous, roughneck Galilean fisherman with a personality like a trampoline to an apostle, a teacher, a leader, a father figure, and as we believe, a true papa, a true pope to the church. And little did anybody know at that time that the place of St. Peter's Borough would become the universal focal focal point for the whole Catholic faith. St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican and his tomb, which in Rome, uh, when I was there in October, uh, I celebrated Mass right there at that tomb. So, the first argument that Peter was no pope, he had no special authority, he was just one of the group, didn't have any primacy or special jurisdiction, it's a myth. And it's an odd one at that. And I say odd because both the biblical and historical evidence that disproves this are so very obvious and overwhelming. Let's take a brief tour through the major scriptural moments that testify to St. Peter's primacy. We use that word, it means the first among equals, the one who is the sign of unity and the voice for the whole church. Well, first, the most telling clue in the New Testament about the primacy of Peter among the apostles is how often his name is mentioned. St. Peter appears 195 times under various names, Simon, Peter, Cephas, or Kephas. You know, the most often mentioned apostle next is St. John, who's mentioned 29 times, St. James the Greater, 19 times, St. Philip, 15 times, and the numbers dwindle rapidly from there. Now, now the numbers don't prove that the primacy of Peter, but it does go a long way, sheds a considerable light on the importance that Peter had among the apostles. Second, when the 12 apostles are listed by name in the scriptures, and you can find it in Mark 10, 2, 5, Mark 3, 16, 19, or excuse me, Matthew 10, 2, 5, uh, Mark 3, 16, 19, Luke 6, 14 to 17, and in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 13. Every time you see a list of the apostles, St. Peter is always listed first, and Judas is always listed dead last. Third, St. Peter is the only apostle who receives a name change from Jesus. You remember that scene, John chapter 1, verse 42 to 43, when Andrew brings his brother, he had met Jesus the day before he brings him, we met the Messiah, and he comes up and Jesus sees him and says, you are Simon, but I call you Peter, which means the rock. We'll get into that. Fourth, St. Peter is the only one, you remember, who gets out of the boat to walk on the water towards Jesus. Apostles had gone out, they were out in the ocean, and then all of a sudden, uh, Jesus stayed on the land, he was praying, they went out, and then all of a sudden they hit a stormy sea, which is very common, because the Sea of Galilee sits in a bowl, and the wind whistles down these canyons, and it can kick up huge waves. You can see that, like at Lake, Lake Michigan near Chicago, many, many large ships have just sunk under those huge storms. So they're in this terrible storm, hard at it, and all of a sudden Jesus walks across the water towards him, and and Jesus, Peter says, if it's really you, Lord, let me come out to meet you. And he says, he beckons him out. And he starts walking on the water. And, of course, he's doing fine when he keeps his eyes on Jesus. But then when he takes his eyes off, Jesus looks at all the huge waves. He panics. He begins to see. Jesus grabs him. But the fact of the matter is that he was the one who got out of the boat and walked towards Jesus. And even began to falter. Jesus assures him that he's always going to be there to help him 
promise that he would extend not just to Peter, but to all his successors. Fifth, uh, Jesus demonstrated a very special relationship with Simon Peter. I say that because you find many incidents in the New Testament. Jesus, for example, chose Peter's boat when he preached to the crowds, Luke 5, 3. Remember, the crowds were crowding in so much, so he had to get in a boat because he's kind of being crushed against, he's getting almost pushed into the water. So whose boat he gets into? A lot of boats there. He got into Peter's. St. Peter was the only one who answered correctly Jesus' question at Caesarea Philippi. Who do people say that I am? He was the only one that got it correct. And Jesus promised to build his church on Peter and to entrust to Peter the keys of the kingdom of God. St. Peter as, was present at significant moments in Jesus' life, often with James and John. And I alluded to some of those. The raising of the dead daughter of Jairus. Jesus took three apostles, Peter, James, and John. The transfiguration, again, on the mountain there. He was transfigured. In fact, we're going to hear about that in this coming Sunday's gospel, where the disciples see him for the first time as he really is. Divinity shining through his humanity. But who's there? Peter, James, and John. And then later on in the gospel, Matthew 17, 24 to 27, there's a really cute little story where Jesus got to pay the temple tax, you know. I think he was about excited about pay, paying that tax like we are, paying our taxes. So he tells Peter to throw his, uh, his uh, line into the sea and he pulls out a fish and he, Peter opens the mouth of the fish and there's a coin in it and he said, now you take that and you pay the temple tax for you and for me. Again, this special bond. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane after the Last Supper, they go into the garden and Jesus asked Peter, James, and John to come aside from the others and to join him in prayer. So we see him at these very special moments. Six, Jesus prayed for St. Peter at the Last Supper when he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to sift all of you. And that you there in Greek is the plural you. He's referring to Satan wants to sift all you apostles like wheat. But I have prayed for you, a singular Peter, that your faith, Peter's faith, may not fail. Remember now, Jesus was speaking to Peter alone, telling him to brace himself for an imminent attack by Satan who wanted to destroy the apostles. And then, and he obviously did to Judas at that time. And then later on, he prayed that he'd be the one who would strengthen his fellow apostles. Seventh, Simon Peter is shown as a leader. For example, the tomb of Christ. When the women had come to the apostles, said, we went to his tomb and he's not there, he's risen. So we had seen an angels. And so the James and, I mean, Peter and John run. And of course, John is a younger man. He out, outran the Peter and he gets to the tomb. But the gospel says he waited. And it was Peter that entered the tomb first. Then the risen Jesus, as I said before, he appeared to Peter first. We hear that in Luke 24, 34. He appeared to Peter first before the other apostles. The eighth reason about the primacy of Jesus in the, in the uh, Gospels is this. After the resurrection, it's Jesus who allows Peter to reaffirm his faith by asking him three times, Peter, do you love me? You know, a lot of scholars say it was a chance for him to redeem himself for denying Jesus three times in the courtyard of Caiaphas. Do you love me? Or do you know that I love you? And then Peter was kind of hurt when he asked him the third time. But what was Jesus doing? He was rebuilding Peter. And in doing so, he made Peter the shepherd of the church, telling him, again, him, it's always a singular, Peter, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. In Acts 1, 13, 26, we see St. Peter leading the other apostles and choosing Matthias as the replacement to Judas. In Acts 2, 14, we see Peter leading the apostles and preaching to the crowds on the day of Pentecost. They explode out of the upper room, go right into this huge crowd. Terrified him before, now they're just emboldened by the power of the Spirit. And who's leading it? St. Peter, as I said, resulted in 3,000 conversions and baptisms. We see St. Peter in Acts 3 performing the first miracle at Pentecost when he healed the crippled man. It was Peter who did that. And then 
later on in Acts 4, Peter speaks in the name of all the apostles and for the whole church when the 12 apostles are brought before the Sanhedrin. Also in Acts 11, it's to St. Peter that God sent the revelation through that vision at Joppa. The Gentiles were to be allowed into the church. And it is St. Peter who first welcomes them. And in Acts 15, it's St. Peter's dogmatic pronouncement about the acceptance of Gentiles that was accepted and it caused all disputes to cease at the Council of Jerusalem. People don't know how significant that council was in about 49, 50 AD. The church was almost being split. You had uh, one group, the Ju- Ju- Jewish Christians, who wanted to stay with the, basically the Jewish law with a thin veneer of Christianity, and Paul leading the charge out to the Gentiles and converting them. That got the gospel meant for everybody. But the tension was between them. And it was Peter's dis- proclamation revealed by, to him by God that stopped everything. Then after his conversion and being healed of his blindness, what did St. Paul do? He went to visit Peter to have his teachings confirmed by Peter. That's Galatians 1.18. And then in Galatians 2.12, uh, 2, 2 verses 1 and 2, Paul repeats this link to Peter's authority, if indirectly when he says, he received by revelation the call to go and present himself to those of repute. And clearly, Peter was the foremost of those of repute in Jerusalem. In other words, St. Paul saw Peter as the very touchstone of orthodoxy. So you see, the biblical evidence is wide and deep, but there's a whole lot more. A lot of testimony from the early church fathers. For example, there's St. Clement's letter to the church at Corinth. Who was St. Clement? He was the fourth pope. His papacy ran from 88 to 97. Get the scene now, how close that is to Jesus, only 50, 60 years. St. Clement had actually been taught by St. Peter and St. Paul. As the Pope, he sent a letter to the community at Corinth, commanding that the rebellious Christians of Corinth restore the validly appointed priest. Because what was happening here? Well, some of the Corinthian Christians had literally revolted against the apostolically appointed priest, and they went and appointed new priests for themselves on their own authority. And it was a tremendous concern to the Christians of Corinth, and they appealed to Rome, to St. Clement, exercising his authority as the successor of Peter in a manner that was both gentle and firm. St. Clement instructed the Christians in Corinth that God desired obedience and order, whereas disobedience and disorder is the will of the devil. This is what he wrote. Disgraceful, beloved, indeed exceedingly disgraceful and unworthy of your training in Christ is the report that well-established and ancient of of the Corinthians is, thanks to one or two individuals, against the presbyters. Why is this letter so significant in terms of historical evidence of the primacy of Peter and the fact that it meant to go on? Well, St. Clement's epistle demonstrates that the early church was rooted in apostolic succession, that it was meant to be passed on one to the next, and that the clergy derived their authority from God and not from the laity. It also demonstrated, this letter also demonstrated the universal primacy of the Bishop of Rome and that Clement asserted his authority as the Bishop of Rome, the first among the equals, he asserted his authority over an internal manner of a particular local church that was not his own. So as such, the letter was the first exercise of the Roman primacy after St. Peter's death. And we know that because the Corinthians, the Christians at Corinth, they affirmed Clement's authority over their community by doing what? They restored the validly appointed, ordained priest. And they were so moved and so changed by that letter that literally they read that letter at every Sunday Mass, as part of the, uh, along with the scriptures, for a hundred years. That's how significant it was. Another uh, evidence in history was St. Ignatius of Antioch. He died about the year 116 AD. The writings of Ignatius prove that the early Christian belief in the primacy of St. Peter. Ignatius, he was a Christian in Antioch. He had been arrested 
of the persecution of Trajan is going on. And St. Ignatius was arrested. He was being uh, taken to Rome. And along the way, he wrote several letters to Christian communities, including the Christian community at Rome. But his letter to the Romans, it differs markedly from the ones he wrote to the Ephesians, the Magnesians, the Tralians, the Philadelphians, and the Smyrnians. They almost sound like Smurfs, don't they? But I always hated that in this scripture, trying to memorize all these names, Smyrnians. Now, all those letters to the other communities, not Rome, but all the other to other communities, they were warning about embracing heresy. But there was no such warning to the church in Rome. And why was that? Because it indicated Ignatius' belief that Rome, the church of Rome, could not embrace heresy because of the special ministry exercised by the Pope, who has infallibility, you see. And in, during, in that letter, Ignatius you, highly exalted the Roman church in language that he didn't use for the other communities when he wrote to them. This is what he said. The Roman church was worthy of God, worthy of honor, worthy of being called blessed, worthy of praise, worthy of success, worthy of veneration. In short, you see, St. Ignatius of Antioch, now we're at 116, huh? He took for granted the unique status within the church, the Roman church, and particularly the Pope. Other signs from history, very important prelates from other regions would go to Rome, from other Christian communities, would go to Rome to discuss matters of real importance. For example, St. Polycarp of Smyrna. He traveled to Rome in the year 154 AD to discuss the dating of Easter with Pope Pius I. His reign was about 140 to 155. What was the issue? The issue was a very contentious one of the church. It concerned the date of Easter. You see, in the Eastern Church, where Polycarp was, truly Catholic, but on the Eastern side, the Eastern Church has followed the Jewish calendar celebrating Easter on the 14th day of the Jewish month of Nisan, no matter what day of the week it was. The Roman and the Western churches always celebrated Easter on the final Sunday after the first full moon of the vernal equinox. It was a contention. He went to talk to the Pope about it because it was almost threatening to split the church. And it was resolved by a kind of a compromise. They continued doing their different dates. The issue, the issue of, by the way, the dating of Easter was not resolved until 325 at the Council of Nicaea when it was mandated the Roman method of the first Sunday after the vernal equinox would be the date of Easter. Another uh, historical character would be St. Ignatius. You know, the early church was dealing with all kinds of heresies, the heresy of Arianism, the heresy of Gnosticism, well, St. Irenaeus was the bishop of Lyon, Lyon in France. Well, on those days, it was Gaul, Roman Gaul. And he confronted this heresy, and he wrote a treatise against it. It was called Against Heresies. And in this book, his writings, Ignatius set forth, taught a five-part explanation of the heresy of Gnosticism, and then he presented the arguments against each Point. But in that uh, writings, uh, Irenaeus also listed, as part of the teaching, the Roman pontus from St. Peter to the reigning pope of his time, which was St. Eleutherius. It was about 175 to 189. And Irenaeus highlighted the universality of the Petrine office by noting that only four of the first 13 popes were actually from the city of Rome. In other words, they came from all over. Like we have Pope Francis, he's from Argentina, this whole idea. We had popes from Africa and from the Middle East. In refuting Gnosticism in this writings, Irenaeus asserted that the church that is Catholic, which means universal, must preach the same gospel as the other churches, must be rooted in apostolic succession, and must be in agreement with the church, 
which is, as I quote, is the greatest and most important and best known of all, founded and organized by the two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul. For with this church, because of her most powerful preeminence, all churches must agree. See, we see this very powerful evidence in history. By the way, in many of the people who attack the church, especially our, our beautiful Christians who are not Catholic, they just haven't had the opportunity to really to read history. They've stayed with the scriptures and it's a beautiful state of the scriptures, but they haven't had the opportunity. A lot of them that get into history, into the early writers of the church, the church fathers, you see a lot of them converting because of that. Other myths to disprove the primacy and the infallibility of Peter, it's what I alluded to during my uh, simple presentation about the life of St. Peter. And this is called the Petros Petra argument. The Petros Petra argument comes from Matthew 16, 16 and 19. Is that famous scene when Jesus asked the apostles, who do you say that I am? I'd like to read that passage to you. When Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his apostles, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus said to him in reply, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld, or the gates of Sheol, or the gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This beautiful passage you have to note this, only Peter gives the right answer. And Jesus entrusts to Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven to bind and the loose. Now, the Protestant version of this text, using the original Greek, will challenge you a lot of times as Catholics say, uh uh, that's not what Jesus meant. Didn't Jesus didn't say, You are Peter and upon this rock I'll build my church? This is how they, they read the Greek. This is how the Greek reads. You are Petros, P-E-T-R-O-S, Peter. And upon this, in the Greek is, word is Petra, P-E-T-R-A, which they believe refers to Christ, I will build my church. So they say Jesus wasn't making Peter the first pope with infallible authority. Uh-uh. Well, you know, when a lot of Catholics hear, oh my gosh, Greek. Jeez. These people are smart. I don't know any Greek. I'm in deep trouble now. They kind of gulp. And they think, well, I guess they're right. Well, does the biblical text prove that Protestant version? No, it doesn't. Let's go back and examine just the text briefly. The passage, this text, by the way, is the passage that Catholics have used down through the centuries, believing that this would de demonstrates that Christ truly conferred unto Peter a unique office and primacy among the Peter apostles and a unique authority. This passage shows us several things. First, we see that there is a confusion as to Christ's identity. And the confusion, though, was checked by Simon Peter, who spoke up, providing the correct answer to that great Christological question, who is the Christ? Second, as our Lord Jesus explained in the, in the passage, the correct answer wasn't the result of mere human ingenuity or intellectual effort. Ah, Jesus tells us Simon had received a revelation from his heavenly Father that enabled him to give the correct answer. In other words, Peter, illuminated by God's grace, he cut through the clutter of all the erroneous theological speculations that others were offering, and he answered the question correctly. And third, what's important to note, neither Christ nor the Heavenly Father gave the answer directly. Rather, the teaching about Christ's identity and mission was given through St. Peter. In other words, Peter 
who was to be entrusted by Christ with the keys of the kingdom, was even then, without him fully realizing it, he was beginning to fulfill the role in the apostolic college to be the first among the equals. So the, the Lord's post-ascension practice of teaching the gospel and delivering revelation through his chosen followers, the apostles and the disciples, it actually begins here at this a little place called Caesarea Philippi. The second thing I think we need to consider is the setting of Matthew 16, 16 to 19. Where did this event happen? We heard it at Caesarea Philippi. The ancients knew and called that place Paneus since it had been dedicated to the god Pan. When Philip Herod became the tetrarch of that region, well, he saw a, a chance to curry favor with, with uh, Imperial Rome, and he did so by changing the name of that place, Paneus, to the Latin Caesarea Philippi, which essentially means Caesar's city from Philip. Okay. It's located, if you go to Israel, it's located way up in the northeast Israel, high in the mount, foothills of Mount Hermon, in the Mount Hermon range. Mount Hermon is the tallest mountain just north of uh, Israel. It's where the borders of Lebanon, Syria, and Israel meet. It's the location of it. In his book on this rock, Father Stanley Jockey, he describes the place as it would, as it would have looked when Peter and the apostles and Jesus were there long ago. It was a splendid pagan city lying in clear sight of a huge 200-foot wall of rock. On the top of that wall of rock, there glistens a white marble temple dedicated to Caesar. At the bottom, there's an idyllic sanctuary dedicated to the god Pan. And immediately left of the sanctuary, there is a fathomless or seemingly fathomless cavity or cave from which a tremendous amount of water flows. It's one of the three sources of the Jordan River. And from ancient times, that cave was known to the local inhabitants as what? the gates of Sheol, or the gates of the under the world, or the gates of the nether world, or we would say the gates of hell. So that's the scene. So try to imagine this now. Christ is speaking to the apostles using that huge rock as the backdrop. And on top of the rock stands a temple, inside of which stands a pagan idol, a false god. There's two key parallels that are very striking. Number one, Christ is the true God, not Caesar, not Pan, not any other pagan divinity. And two, the false God's church, the temple, sits atop of this huge rock. But Christ now will build his church on rock, Simon, son of Jonah. See, the importance of this passage, it kind of leaps into our view when we see how Jesus used the symbol of the gigantic rock in a pagan temple on top of it to contrast what he's going to do with his church, building his church on a rock. And Simon, the impulsive fisherman, is going to be that new rock. Okay. Now, despite all these clues written in the scriptures, many non-Catholics still believe that the alleged difference in the meaning between the original Greek words petros and petra seem to be two different words, huh? proves that Jesus wasn't referring to Simon Peter. Uh-uh. When he said, on this rock, I will build my church, Jesus was really referring to himself and not to Simon Peter. Or he was referring to simply Simon's confession of faith or to something other, uh, altogether different. What he was saying is, you are Peter, Petros, and upon this Petra I will build my church. That's how they see it. Now, there's two big problems with that argument. First, at the time of Christ, there was no linguistic distinction between the Greek nouns Petros and Petra, the masculine and feminine forms of that one word, meaning a rock. And by the way, that fact has been uh, taught and uh, confirmed by many Protestant biblical scholars, such as Oscar Coleman and D.A. Carson. Second, if Jesus was contrasting himself as the rock, Petra, on which he would build his church with Peter as the little rock, Petros, 
The truth is, the Greek wouldn't have used the word petros. It would have used another common Greek term called lithos, which means a little rock, a pebble, because that's how the Protestants did. See, the difference between the two words, petros and petra, what's going on there? It's respecting the proper grammar reflected in language. Jesus, you see, was making a play on words. Remember, back in John chapter 1, verse 42, when Jesus called Simon to be his apostle, Jesus gave Simon a new name. As one of the great distinctions that we know about Peter, his name was Simon, but I now you call you Peter. Your name is Simon, now I call you, in Greek, Petros. Okay. So Simon, uh, Jesus gave Simon a new name. Now, unlike English, in Greek, as in many other languages, nouns have gender. In Greek, Petra is a feminine noun, and it's unsuitable to be used as a name of a man. So to remedy this, St. Matthew simply changed it to correct, to correct it to the masculine form of the word Petros, again, a play on words. Now, how do we know that this is really true? Well, first of all, because biblical scholars tell us that there was an underlying Aramaic original text of St. Matthew's Gospel from which the Greek version was translated. See, once you get back to the original, the apparent Petros, Petra problem, it totally evaporates. See, the, the gospel is written in Aramaic. Well, the Aramaic word for rock is kepha. So in Aramaic, there is no change in the words or the endings. So the scripture passage reads, you are Peter, kepha, and upon this Rock, Kepha, I will build my church. Second point is this. The Petros Petra argument ignores the fact that in their daily lives, Peter and the apostles didn't speak to each other in Greek. They spoke in the language, the common language of the day, which was Aramaic. It was the language of the Jewish people at that time. So when we read in Matthew 16, 18, what is it? It's really the Greek rendering of the Aramaic conversation between the Lord and and Simon Peter. And in Aramaic, as I said before, there is no masculine or feminine distinction between the noun kepha, which has only one meaning, the rock. Now, how can we know for sure that this is true? Well, let's go to, back to the story of John 1, 41, uh, 1, 41 and 42, when Jesus first meets Simon. It reads this way. He, Andrew, first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, we have found the Messiah, and then John includes this little detail, which is translated the anointed. And then he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Kephas. And then he puts this little parenthesis again, which is translated Peter. Now, this passage, first of all, makes clear that Jesus intended to confer on Simon a new name. That was significant, by the way, because when God has something new for people to do, he gives them a new name. Abram became Abraham. Jacob became Israel. A sign of something great and a new mission beginning. Simon Kephas. But also in this text, you see, St. John was careful to, to help his Greek-speaking Christians who did not know Aramaic or did not know Hebrew by translating into Greek two of the key terms in that passage that he, that he wanted to preserve them. So he, he turned two terms. First, Messiah. That was a Hebrew word. Remember how he translated the little princes, which means the anointed one. Huh? That's by the way we get the word Christos, and that's why we're Christians, because we were baptized, we are anointed. That's what Christ, uh, Christos means, the anointed one of God. We become the anointed ones of God as well. So he first translated Messiah into Greek, Christos, uh, so that they would know. And Kepha is translated into Peter, so that these Greeks we could be able to know what he was talking about. Because the Greek Christians, all they knew Peter by, this wonderful apostle, fisherman, become apostle and pope, they only knew him by his name Peter. And they're hearing this word Kepha. Oh, that's just a translation of the name. And this is clear from other passages of Scripture that refer to Peter as Cephas, for example, in Galatians 2, 9, 11. The early church fathers 
also affirm this fact that the Gospel of Matthew was originally written in Aramaic and only later translated in Greek for the benefit of the Greek-speaking people who were coming into the church. For example, Eusebius, in his famous ecclesiastical history, he records that Bishop Papias is recorded saying that St. Matthew wrote his gospel in the Hebrew language. St. Irenaeus and Eusebius maintained that Matthew wrote his gospel for the Hebrews in their national language, which was Hebrew. The same assertion is made by several of the early church writers. Now, in the time of Jesus, the national language of the Jewish people was Aramaic. So in the New Testament, when there's a mention of the word Hebrew or the Hebrew language, what it really is doing is talking about the uh, Aramaic language. So let's continue with another statement that people have made to object to the primacy of Peter. And that comes from Matthew 16, 23. In that very dialogue, after Peter got the answer right, uh, when Jesus called Simon Peter Satan in Matthew 6, 23, this proves that Jesus did not make Peter a pope. Let's look at that passage. Jesus told him that he was going to suffer and die. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid, Lord. No, no, such, I mean, no such thing ever happened to you. And then Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an obstacle to me. You're not thinking as God does, but as human beings do. Now, does this invalidate Peter and his primacy and his authority? No. Now, it's true that Jesus uses a harsh word to rebuke the impetuous Peter, but this doesn't negate his earlier promises about Peter's primacy. Why do I say that? Well, in Matthew 16, 18 to 19, you've got to remember when he said, You are Peter, and upon this rock of I will build my church and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Jesus was promising to give him that authority, but it was going to be a little later time. And that time came after the resurrection, when Jesus turned to Simon Peter and told him, do you love me, Peter? Then feed my lambs, feed my sheep. So Peter didn't assume the fullness of his office at that moment of Caesarea Philippi. And even when he assumed it, he kind of grew into it. He entered into it gradually and fully so on the day of Pentecost. As for Christ's rebuke, we've got to keep in mind what Jesus meant when he called Peter Satan. Jesus did not identify Peter literally as the devil or the evil one or the fallen one. Rather, our Lord was speaking figuratively. Remember, what was preceded this? Jesus had just finished telling the apostles that he was going to go to Jerusalem, he was going to suffer, and he was going to die. He had to be killed. Well, wow, imagine the reaction of the apostle when you just kind of deliver this, like telling somebody, oh, by the way, I've got cancer and I'm dying in a week. You know, what? I mean, the shock of it, huh? Peter resisted this horrifying uh, prediction, which was a perfectly natural reaction. But as happened so often in the past, Peter and the other apostles, they didn't really recognize and understand Jesus' divine mission as a Messiah. They had kind of thoughts of glory and thoughts of, the, of military power and earthly wealth and gain. They didn't fully recognize Jesus' divine mission that included his suffering and death on the cross to pay for the sins of all people. So when Peter responded to Jesus with, in his grim prediction, well, he said, God forbid, Lord, no such thing will ever happen to you. What's really behind that? Peter was being really protective of his good friend. And I think Jesus knew this because his response to Peter was this, get behind me, Satan. The word Satan in Greek means adversary or opponent. By his effort to stop Jesus from going to Jerusalem to suffer and die, unwittingly Peter was opposing God's plan of salvation. You're an obstacle to me. Peter wasn't thinking with Christ, uh uh you're not thinking as God does, but as human beings do. So Jesus used the word Satan to emphasize how contrary Peter and the other apostles too, how contrary the thinking was to Jesus' mission as the Messiah, the Redeemer. Calling Peter Satan, you see, 
it really shows the gravity of the situation facing Jesus and how critically important it was that Jesus fulfill the mission that he had been sent by his father to do. And any effort, however inadvertent, to prevent Jesus from doing that mission, well, it was worthy of a rebuke. Now, does this event somehow contradict the doctrine of papal infallibility? And the answer is no, not at all. And why do I say that? Well, as I mentioned before, Peter had not yet been made the head of the church. In verse 18, Jesus said, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will, I will build my church. I will give you the keys. That's a future tense, a future event. So too, in verse 19, Jesus said, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. This infallible authority had not yet been given to Peter at that moment. And for this reason alone, or those reasons alone, the issue of papal infallibility, it's completely irrelevant. Also, this myth that Jesus' rebuke invalidated Peter's future primacy and his future papal infallibility, it doesn't make sense given the content and the context of the story. I mean, think of the story. It doesn't make sense that Jesus would go from praising and honoring, elevating Simon Peter, and then in the next breath to mock him and to rebuke him, and then to go back in the next breath to entrust to him the authority and honor that he would ultimately get. But I'm going to give you another more fundamental reason why the church's teaching about the papacy isn't jeopardized by this rebuke of Christ to Peter. See, the Catholic Church, what we believe, we claim that popes, starting with Peter himself, are guarded in their infallibility from formally teaching error. There is no claim by the Catholic Church that popes, including Peter, first of all, cannot be wrong in their personal opinions, their private opinions, and cannot be wrong in their behavior. Clearly, in this story, Peter was incorrect in his thinking, as the Lord Jesus was showing him. But, this, but his was really an error in judgment. It wasn't proclaiming, as we say, a dogma that had to be believed and held by all. Peter, you see, simply misunderstood what was about to happen. And that's, that's it. The next uh, corollary to this myth is this. St. Peter himself denies that he has special primacy when he, Peter, refers to himself as merely a fellow presbyter in 1 Peter 5.1. Let's read that one. The letters 1 Peter 5.1 says, So I exhort the presbyters among you as a fellow presbyter and witness to the suffering of Christ and one who has a share in the glory to be revealed. Now, does that phrase, a fellow presbyter, does that nullify Peter's primacy? Answer again is no. What is Peter showing here? He's showing humility. See, Peter's humility was not a signal that he was unaware of his special role as the chief apostle for the church that Christ had conferred on him, a, 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 a title, not just a title, but an authority. The answer, you see, is found a little later in that same passage, 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Peter says, Clothe yourself in humility in your dealings with one another, for God opposes the proud, but bestows favor on the humble. So humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. See, St. Peter was just following his own advice as well as Christ's command. You remember, Jesus said, whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Matthew 20 26, 27. So you see, St. Peter's humility shouldn't blind us to the substantial body of biblical and historical evidence that shows that Peter did receive a special apostolic preeminence and an authority from Jesus. By the way, St. Paul, who the, our non-Catholic brothers and sisters adore, and he should be because he wrote well, over one-third of the New Testament, St. Paul, you see, demonstrated the same kind of humility without nullifying his own authority. As with St. Peter, you can see these examples of St. Paul's humility balanced with his statements on authority. Philemon 8.9. Although I had the full right to order you to do what is proper, I rather urge you out of love. 
and 1 Thessalonians 2, 7. Although we were able to impose our weight as apostles of Christ, rather we were gentle among you as a nursing mother cares for her children. So the fact that he calls himself a fellow presbyter has nothing to do with nullifying his authority as the first pope. The next kind of myth that gets thrown at you comes from Galatians 2, 11, 4, where St. Paul publicly rebukes St. Peter. And according to the skeptics of the church, ah, this proves, see, that Peter was not the pope. Here's the passage. And when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he clearly was wrong. For until some people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to draw back and separated himself because he was afraid of the circumcised. And the rest of the Jews also acted hypocritically along with him, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not on the right road in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of all, if you, though a Jew, are living like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now, many opponents to the papacy, they, they appeal very strongly to this classic proof text to disprove the Catholic claims that Peter had papal authority and papal primacy and infallibility on two points. First, if Peter was in error, and this, he was in error, therefore he's not infallible. And then Paul rebuked him, so Peter had no special authority over Paul. See how that goes? Well, they seem kind of convincing, but they're not. You know, the irony of this background, of this passage is that you've got to remember it was specifically to St. Peter that the Lord had given a revelation regarding the Gentiles being allowed into the church without needing to observe the Mosaic ceremonial laws such as circumcision and kosher food restrictions. That would happen in the Acts of the Apostles when Peter in Joppa had this vision. St. Paul was exasperated with Peter. And you hear that, it, his response to him, you of all people, Peter, God gave you the revelation that cleared up this Gentile issue once for all, and look at you. You're not abiding by the policy which you yourself laid down at the Council of Jerusalem. It comes from Acts 15. Now, despite Paul's exasperation, when you get down to it, this passage has nothing to do with teaching. Remember, infallibility always connected to teaching. It has nothing to do with teaching, but rather with Peter's personal actions. Paul rebuked Peter, rebuked Peter for what he saw was really hypocritical behavior, not for heretical teaching. We know that because you are not abiding by the policy which you yourself laid down. So he wasn't living or obeying that policy. Here's the critical point. As far as papal infallibility is concerned, personal behavior has nothing to do with infallibility. Never confuse impeccability, being sinless or not sinning, with infallibility, which means unable to err on matters of faith and morals when speaking in the name of the whole church and when the Pope declares what he has to say is ex cathedra, speaking from the chair of the authority of Peter. See, what Peter did in this situation, well, it may or may not have been correct, but regardless, this passage doesn't disprove papal infallibility. Why do I say that? Because the church's teaching on papal infallibility rests on the issue of what the Pope formally teaches to the church as a whole, not the personal decisions he makes about how to act in any given situation. Later on in the midst of the popes, we're going to talk about some of the bad popes, you know. And see, that nullifies because there are bad popes, immoral behavior. Infallibility has nothing to do with uh, immorality. So let's return to the backstory of Galatians 2. The Council of Jerusalem, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, St. Peter, with his guidance, the church decides that Jewish Gentiles do not have to undergo circumcision or follow the kosher Jewish food laws. That was important for uh, Gentiles, especially circumcision. A lot of the people coming to the church were adults, you know. 
And there it was something they did not want to go through. And that's why, if you remember in the, uh, in the gospel, when Jesus cleans out the temple, the first court of the temple is called the court of the Sebamenites, which means in Greek, the God fears. Who are they? They were people who were very attracted to Judaism because of their belief in one God, their incredible uh, obedience to God's laws, their extraordinary charity to people, their wonderful morality. They were attracted to that. What kept them out was circumcision and all the minutia of the Mosaic law. So they would come to Jerusalem to worship, but they couldn't go into the place of the court of the priest or the Hebrew men. They had to stay outside. And that's where they were selling all the animals. And Jesus got really upset because the people come to seek God and you are crowding them out. This place smells like a ranch, a barnyard, you know. So he drove them out. Okay, so... That's why uh, that decision was made. And Peter, for a while, according to the text, was eating with Gentile Christians. But then he heard that some people were coming from the community of Jerusalem, the community of St. James, who were very Jewish Christian. They were coming to visit him, and he felt that they would be rattled to find him eating with Gentile Christians. They hadn't made the kind of the switch over yet. So he thought it might be best for him to stop the practice, at least temporarily, and he did this to avoid, to avoid scandalizing his visitors and to create a controversy. When St. Paul saw that, he was really unhappy. And as we read in that story, when he had the opportunity, he confronted Peter and rebuked him for it. And all those who followed him, they were not on the right road in line with the truth of the gospel. You've got to remember this, though. Besides being the shepherd of the universal church, Peter had a special charism of being sent to the apostle to the circumcised. We see that in Galatians 2.7. So naturally, we, he, he, uh, he would expect to have a special sensitivity to the attitudes and the concerns of the Jewish Christians. That's what he was, huh? very sensitive to it. His action, you see, was an attempt to keep from making waves with the Jewish Christians, Something, again, going back to the Council of Jerusalem, something that the Council of Jerusalem was trying to resolve, this rift, this tension, this in-house fighting. Now, even though St. Paul tagged St. Peter with the charge of hypocrisy, the case isn't as clear-cut as it seems. See, non-Catholics who use Galatians 2 to attack the Catholic Church's teaching on papal infallibility and the primacy of St. Peter, they need to understand that this passage becomes literally a two-edged sword. Was Peter's hypocrisy really as damning as it appears? Well, first of all, Peter may not have been committing nearly as big a faux pas as St. Paul's complaint in Galatians 2 seems to say it was. Remember, the Council of Jerusalem decree bound Jewish, I mean, Gentile Christians to observe certain regulations in order for what? To keep them from offending the sensitivity of the other part of the church, the Jewish Christians, who were very Jewish and Christian. So St. Peter essentially did the same thing by avoiding a circumstance that, or a situation that would, might have caused scandal for a group of people in the church. Now, the exquisite irony here is that St. Paul himself did the same thing. I'll get to it. He hardly endorsed the very practice he rebuked St. Peter for, the pa practice avoiding scandal and controversy over eating habits. In his letter to the Romans, St. Paul instructed the community at Rome, I quote, Then let us no longer judge one another, but rather resolve never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Still, it is unclean for someone else who thinks it's unclean. If your brother is being hurt by what you eat, your conduct is no longer in accord with love. Do not, because of your food, destroy him for whom Christ died. So do not let your good be reviled. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of food and drink, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by others. Let us then pursue what leads to peace and to building up one another. For the sake of food, do not destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, 
But it is wrong for anyone to become a stumbling block by eating. It is not good to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. This is Romans 14, 15 to 21. St. Paul said the same thing in 1 Corinthians 8, 7 to 13. Now, if St. Paul's rebuke of St. Peter over the issue of his, his, hypocr- his hypocrisy undermines the claims of Peter's primacy, well, then what does it do to the authority of St. Paul that our non-Catholic brothers and sisters literally adore because he wrote one-third of the New Testament? It could be that St. Paul himself was the real hypocrite for condemning St. Peter for something he himself admitted to doing and encouraged others to do. You know, in his letter to the Galatians, you ever read it, St. Paul was ferociously angry at the Judaizers. Who were the Judaizers? They were Jewish Christian, a radical group who would tail after St. Paul after he established these communities and encourage them to, to become Christian and got them baptized. They didn't have to get circumcised. These guys would follow in after and say, ah, if you want to be a real Christian, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to do the circumcision. Paul was so frustrated with them. So frustrated that if you read the Greek, it says, the next time you circumcise, I hope the knife slips. <laughs> That's how angry he was, you see. Very angry. But in his letter to the Galatians, St. Paul was condemning the Judaizers in their efforts to force circumcision and other Jewish ceremonies on Gentile Christians by asking, am I now currying favor with human beings or God? Or am I seeking to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I wouldn't be a slave of Christ, Galatians 1.10. Clearly see here that St. Paul's goal is to please God regardless of what other people think. But notice what happens. He warns in Galatians 5.2, It is I, Paul, who am telling you that if you have yourself circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Okay, so he's kind of pretty tough here. Yet amazingly, St. Paul himself, when faced with the problem of unruly Judaizers in Lyconia, what did he do? He had St. Timothy circumcised, Acts 16, 1 to 3. He had him circumcised. See, this is where the dilemma arises for those who see Galatians 2 as disproving the Catholic teaching of papal infallibility and papal primacy. If Peter can be discredited and disqualified as Pope because he was hypocritical by withdrawing from the table fellowship with Gentile believers, well, then what about Paul's credibility authority? It's, even, it's ruined even more because he had Timothy circumcised. It wasn't just like having a meal or not a meal. He had him circumcised, a major factor over which everything was being fought. He had him circumcised, why? On account of the Jews who would have balked if Timothy had remained uncircumcised. In other words, he's there at Iconia trying to preach the gospel. This is a big stumbling block. Obviously, in spite of his warnings in Galatians 5.2, St. Paul's authority wasn't squandered because he made a prudential decision to have Timothy circumcised. See, St. Paul, he knew he didn't see circumcision as something that was, had to be performed in order to become a really true Christian. But Paul seems to have chosen that course of action to avoid needless tension and scandal with the Jews whom he sought to evangelize. You know, in our Christian language, we call this an exercise of prudence and wisdom. Huh? So in the same way that Peter's hypocrisy can be explained quite reasonably as a decision to avoid similar tensions between the, uh, with the Jewish Christians, so with Paul. In any case, uh, we find ourselves being drawn back to the same conclusions. St. Peter's action in this case have nothing to do with his office as chief apostle nor do they undermine or disprove the Catholic teaching of papal infallibility. They were simply dealing with what? His personal deeds, done at a time of kind of real perplexion, uh, vexing, uncertainty, for everybody that was involved in it. Now, it may be that St. Peter made a mistake, and St. Paul was right to rebuke him. But you see, such a rebuke wouldn't conflict with the special primacy or authority of Peter that Jesus gave to him. 
Popes have been rebuked privately and publicly by other Catholics since Peter's time. Now, the cases are not real frequent, but they've happened. For example, the great Dominican, St. Catherine of Siena, she traveled all the way to Avignon, France in 1376 to confront Pope Gregory IX and to admonish him public for staying away from Rome. For 70 some years, the Pope had left Rome and was residing in Avignon, France. And she goes there. She rebukes him and pleads for him to come home. And a rebuked work, he did come home. And finally, there's a real important point that should be made to those who still insist that popes can't be infallible because they're sinful, weak men. I say to the people who say that, especially our Protestant brothers and sisters, who believe in the teaching of fallibility, I said, look, you believe in the teaching of fallibility of three very sinful, weak men. Two of them were murderers, Moses and Saul of Tarsus, and the third was a murderer and an adulterer, King David. But you see, in spite of their sinfulness, guess what? God was still able to use them to do what? To teach very infallibly, to give us God's holy word. And the same is true with St. Peter and the rest of the popes. We'll stop there. And if there's any questions, uh, let's have some time if you have any questions. And we'll come back. And it'll give me, if I'm March 26, to not only cover the next few uh, myths, but also someone brought up one today about um, the position of St. James, the brother of the Lord in Jerusalem. Why was he the one that, made, that formally made the decision at the Council of Jerusalem? Peter said this is what it is, but it was Peter, I mean, James that spoke. We'll talk about that next week, plus about the fact that the challenge that uh, Peter had no successors. We'll get into that. I do thank you, and I apologize for being a technological troglodyte and not having the full thing on PowerPoint, but next week, uh, I mean, March, I think it's 26, our next one, we'll come back to it. And by the way, we're going to carry the next couple of years because there's a lot of interesting myths about the Pope, so we'll come back to it. But thank you very much. It's a joy to join you. We'll see you in three weeks. It's great to be back, and we continue now the uh, myths about the Pope, Pope Fiction 2. We'll carry on. There's a few more of the myths. We're continuing with the myths about connected to St. Peter and the early papacy because a lot of the myths originate there. And as I said last week, the myths come down to basically two. The controversy over papal primacy. Did Peter have a primacy? Was he first among the apostles designated by Jesus? basically the Pope, first among equals, and papal infallibility. When the, church, when the pre, Pope speaks on matters of faith and morals in the name of the whole church, and what he says, what I'm going to say is ex cathedra, speaking from the chair of Peter, he won't err in what he teaches. So the, the, most of the myths center around that in different kinds of ways in historical context. Tonight we're going to continue to look at some of these myths, such as tonight we're going to talk about Peter had no successors. And the myth goes something like this. Even if Jesus Christ had given Peter a special primacy, there is nothing in Scripture that suggests that his authority was passed on to his alleged successors. So the task to address this myth involves this. It's to show the primacy of Peter was transmitted from Peter to each of his successors, the bishops of Rome. Now, the continuation of Peter's ministry, well, it's tied in many ways to the continuity or the continuation of the apostolic succession. So before we can tackle the specific issues about the succession of Peter and his successors as Bishop of Rome, 
it'd be good for us to outline the biblical evidence for the overarching principle and doctrine of apostolic succession itself. Because we can succeed in establishing that the apostolic succession was intended by Jesus to continue in the church. In other words, the apostles pass on their authority to the next generation of leaders. Even after the death of the original apostles, we can also make the case that Peter's unique role as pope was also to continue as well. First of all, what is apostolic succession? Well, the Catholic Catechism of the Church explains the doctrine of apostolic succession as a perpetual mission intended by Jesus Christ to be carried out in a special way for as long as the church sojourns on earth. Namely, the passing on of the authority from Jesus to the apostles and then on. Now, is there any biblical evidence for the doctrine of apostolic succession? And the answer is yes, of course there is. We know that Jesus intended to pass on his mission and his authority. John chapter 20, verse 21, that great line, As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And you know, you, know, you notice throughout the gospel, like Mark 10, you see Jesus, he sends them already out with his authority to heal people, to drive out e- demons. Already in a public ministry, he's already passing on this power and this authority and his mission. But at the end, right after the resurrection, we hear him, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Now, the apostles clearly understood that their being sent included their own eventual selection and the ordaining and the commissioning of other men who would carry on the mission after they had died. We also see that indication because Jesus promised that he would be with his church until the end of time or the end of the ages or the end of the world. Since Jesus promised that, we can be sure that the church's need for apostolic authority would continue with Peter and also with the other apostles. And we see that fact in the, in the, we see that in the fact that the powers and duties of the apostles, most especially the duties of celebrating the Holy Eucharist, do this in memory of me, that idea that it carries on. We see that in Luke 24. 14. The power to forgive sins, John 20, 19 to 23. Those, you see, were intended to be passed on. If this practice was to continue after the 12 were dead and gone, and we know that it did, well then, it's very logical that other people, other men, would have to be chosen for their right disposition and abilities to be able to succeed in that apostolic ministry and being invested with the power and authority to perform their priestly duties. Now, there's ample biblical evidence to show that the apostles understood that their ministry would be handed down the church. We see this action immediately after the crucifixion and resurrection. As we well know in the scriptures, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed our Lord, hung himself. What happens almost immediately after, in Acts chapter 1, verses 15 to 26, The disciples gathered, led by Peter, and they choose a successor to Judas Iscariot. It was St. Matthias. Other actions of the apostle give firm foundation to the Catholic teaching on apostolic succession in this way. They traveled, they were missionaries traveling throughout the Middle East, ordaining successors and leaving them in charge of churches, communities of faith in various cities. For example, St. Paul wrote to a bishop named Titus. He he writes this in Titus 1.5, This is why I left you in Crete, that you might amend what was defective and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Similarly, St. Paul wrote to Timothy, another young bishop that he had ordained, that he laid hands on. And he said this, Do not lay hands too readily on anyone. 1 Timothy 5.22. Now, why would St. Paul give Timothy that advice? Because the office of bishop has such a unique and important role and authority that each each bishop needed to be chosen very carefully, choose very worthy men to carry on the special ministry and authority of Christ in the church. 
And St. Paul emphasizes this point again when he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, So you, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you heard from me through many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will have the ability to teach others as well. See, in these passages, we can see quite clearly, Paul and Paul, especially in Paul's epistle to Timothy, the first few links in that 2,000-year chain of apostolic succession. Three points that Paul makes there. Number one, I, Paul, have received an apostolic mission from Christ. 2 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. Number two, I've given you, Timothy, this apostolic ministry and authority through the laying on of my hands when I ordained you as a bishop. 2 Timothy 1.6. And the third point, be careful, Timothy, in handing on this apostolic ministry you possess, handing it on to others, so that they in turn will be wise enough to hand it on to the next generation of bishops. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. So we see this clear biblical evidence that this idea of our Lord entrusting his authority is what? He wants the mission to go on through the church and be accomplished through the church. To have that happen, the authority he gives to the apostles and Peter needs to be passed on. Now we have other things. These are not biblical evidence, but they are the writings of the church, early church fathers that lived from the first to the sixth century. They also provide us with a very rich testimony to this doctrine of apostolic succession. Among the many authoritative voices that speak on this issue, one is, and very clearly, is St. Clement. I mentioned him last, uh, last week in my talk. He was Bishop of Rome. In a very simple and eloquent explanation, he, he addressed this letter to the church, Corinth, uh, church of Corinth. As I explained last week, what had happened? The Corinth, Corinthian community had, had deposed, basically, validly ordained priest. Clement writes to them and tells them that not only are they wrong, but they have to restore them, and he's giving an order as the bishop of Rome to do it. Okay. This is what he uh, said. The apostles preached to us the gospel received from Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ was God's ambassador. Christ, in other words, comes with a message from God, and the apostles are the message from Christ. Both of these orderly arrangements, therefore, originate from the will of God. And so, after receiving their instructions, and being fully assured through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, as well as confirmed in faith by the word of God, they went forth proclaiming the kingdom of God it was at hand. From land to land, accordingly, and from city to city, they preached. And from their earliest converts, appointed men, whom they had tested by the Spirit to act as bishops and deacons for the future believers. Our apostles, too, were given to understand by our Lord Jesus Christ that the office of bishop would give rise to intrigues. For this reason, equipped as they were with perfect foreknowledge, they appointed the men mentioned before, and afterwards laid down a rule once for all to this effect. When these men die, other approved men shall succeed to their sacred ministry. I mean, you can't get any more clear evidence. Now, remember, Clement is writing when? He's writing in 80 AD. This is that, that's when the letter was sent. He's still living at the time of the apostle John. And as bishop of Rome, Clement was invoking the authority of apostolic succession in this letter to demonstrate not only the continuity of the church's doctrine and the authority it possessed, but to teach that doctrine to this community of Corinth. And it's significant to note that Clement was strengthening his brethren. The very command that Jesus gave St. Peter at the Last Supper, when he predicted he was going to have himself sifted, Satan was going to take him on. And he told him, but when it gets through, I want you to strengthen your brethren. And this is what Clement is doing, strengthening his brethren. He was acting in the same capacity of leadership as Peter was told by Jesus. Now, another significant thing here is that there was never an outcry from the church at Corinth complaining that Pope Clement was out of line for pre presuming to instruct and admonish another preeminent ch church uh, in, in Corinth. No complaint at all. 
In fact, the clergy restored the original priest. In other words, they, they responded in obedience, and they revered Clement's letter so much that it was read at Sunday Mass. After the readings, Clement's letter was read for the next hundred years. If the doctrine you see of apostolic succession and the primacy of the Roman church was not already well understood by the Christians of the first century, well, there would have been an incredible backlash, but there was nothing, because they recognized this is what Christ intended. There were also other church fathers, such as St. Irenaeus. He was a bishop over in Lyon, France, and in the early second century, he was dealing with Gnosticism. What was going on there was this heresy of Gnosticism, Gnosis, knowledge. A few select had the knowledge, and they would tell you uh, what to do. Kind of sounds like my, some of my government, you know. The Gnosis, we got new Gnosticism. Like other early church fathers, Irenaeus stood that, understood that the sacred ministry of Peter was also to continue through the bishops of Rome. And the way he does that, as I mentioned last week, another point, Irenaeus actually traces all the popes from Peter right up to his own time. And he established the apostolic primacy and authority with that. He announced that it is a matter of necessity that every church should agree with this church, referring to the Church of Rome and the Pope there, on account of its preeminent authority. In doing this, you see, St. Irenaeus anchored his defense of Orthodox Christianity squarely where? On the rock of Peter, on the primacy of Peter and the authority that was passed down. According to St. Irenaeus, this is the place where all Christians can be absolutely certain that the apostolic tradition has been preserved continuously. And we have other evidence, even critics of popes acknowledge the truth of apostolic succession. There's one famous one, it's a letter written by Firmian, or Firmilian. He wrote a diatribe against Pope Stephen, in a letter to the venerable bishop of, uh, of Carthage, St. Cyprian. What was happening there is that both Cyprian and uh, Firmilian were criticizing Pope Stephen for his decision about not rebaptizing heretics. When persecution came, people apostatized, they left, some taught false teaching, and they were cut off from the church. And people like Cyprian and Firmilian said they were cut off, so they have to be rebaptized. Pope Stephen re emphasized the ancient teaching once baptized, baptized for all. They need to be reconnected through another process of penance and reconciliation, but they cannot and will not be baptized. Now, it's interesting, Firmilian was very, very vitriolic in his letter. He criticized severely Pope Stephen, but he did not deny Petrine succession or authority. And then, of course, all you need to do is go to history. You know, I always think of way back, this is years ago, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember Jimmy Swaggart. Anybody remember Jimmy Swaggart? He was on TV. I just remember one time he was just going on and on in one of his teachings. If Peter was the first pope... Who is the second pope? And he went on on the thing. He says, there is no other pope. He, if he was it, he should be. I even want to say, I want to call him and say, Jimmy, baby, just go to the Catholic Encyclopedia. Look up the word pope or papacy, and you'll see a whole list of them. Right in line. Peter all the way down to the current pope. From St. Peter to Pope Francis, we've had 264 popes in a row. All in connection linked to this apostolic authority that was passed down. So we see that Christ intended for his mission and authority to be passed on. It was passed on to Peter and the apostles and their unique authority. And they understood well that it would be passed on at the end of their death to qualified people to continue the mission through the authority of Christ. The second great myth that we're going to cover now is the vicarious filii dei, equals 666, the beast of Revelation. It goes this way. The Pope, by the way, this is a, a myth that the, very much centered on the Seventh-day Adventist church, but 
Many other people have used it. It goes this way. The Pope is the beast of Revelation 13.11 that wears crowns and has blasphemous names written on his head. The Pope's official title in Latin is Vicarius Filii Dei, which translates the Vicar of the Son of God. Now, if you add up the numerical value, the Roman numerals that make up that title, you get the number 666, which we know is the mark of the beast in the book of Revelation, the Antichrist. Also, the Pope's tiara is emblazoned with this title, formed by diamonds and other jewels. Okay, let's look at that myth. You know, like other ancient languages, such as Greek and Hebrew, some Latin letters are used for numbers. We learned that in our math class. Roman numerals, remember? In fact, when you see the Super Bowl, it, it always will write the number of the Super Bowl in Roman numerals. I is one. The V equals five. The X equals 10. The L equals 50. C equals 100. D, 500 and the letter M, a thousand. So, the title, Vicarious Filii Dei, does add up to 666, so I guess that myth is right, huh? How did they get that? Well, you get five for the V, one for the I, a hundred for the C, you don't count vowels, a one for the I, a V, a five for the V, one for the I, 50 for the L, 1 for the I, 1 for the I, 500 for the D, and 1 for the I equals 666. So I guess that is right. Well, the first problem is that vicarious filii dei, or the vicar, the son of God, is not now and has never been an official tile used by the Bishop of Rome. The second problem is that the papal title Vicarious Filii Dei is just a fabrication. It was made up, constructed, kind of like the Russian collusion, made up. Now, one of the Pope's official titles is Vicarious Christi, the Vicar of Christ, but that title only adds up to a measly 214, not the infernal 666. In fact, none of the Pope's official titles, such as Servus Servorum Dei, Servant of the Servants of God, Pontifex Maximus, the Supreme Pontiff, the Supreme Bridge Builder, that's a Pontifex Maximus, or Successor Petri, Successor Peter, none of those official titles add up to 666. And that, by the way, is why you'll never see someone who's trying to promote the anti-Catholic myth why they never use those titles, even though they're the official titles. So if any person ever makes this claim about uh, the title of Vicarious Fili Dei makes up 666, ask that person to furnish you an example of the alleged title being used in some official way by the Pope. Ask for what document? Where do they get that? They won't have it because you won't encounter any papal decree, any conciliar statement, or any authentic official Catholic document which the Pope calls himself the vicar of the Son of God. No example exists, because it's never, ever been the title of a Pope. Now, during the 2,000-year history of the Catholic Church, there have been a few times, a few examples, when the Pope has been described as the vicar of the Son of God, but not by that title. Catholics don't claim that popes have never been, at one time or another, described as the vicar of the Son of God. See, that's not the issue at hand. The issue is, is that the vicarious filii dei has never been a name or official title of the pope. Now, they counter, especially the Seventh-day Adventists, counter by saying, well, well, wait, Pope John Paul II, in his book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, in the first chapter, page 3, John Paul II states, the Pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God. So if you translate the phrase, represents the Son of God, into Latin, you get vicarious filii dei. Well, obviously, they didn't take Latin like Lee and I did, because the fact of the matter is a bad... Latin translation. 
represents the Son of God, when translated directly from Latin is, filium Dei represents, representat, not vicariously fee Dei. Represent, you see, is a verb. Vicar is a noun. Well, then the Seventh-day Adventist will counter this way. Hey, but vicari- uh, vicari- uh, vicarious vili Dei, it can be found in the decretum of Gratian and the corpus of canon. Now, the answer to that is, yes, they can. Those two references are, are historical documents. They come from another historical document called the Donation of Constantine. Problem? It's a forgery, a very famous forgery. Anybody familiar with the medieval church history will know that the document, Donation of Constantine, is one of the, probably the, one of the best known examples of a forged ecclesiastical document. And it's such, so, it's such it can't be regarded as an official Catholic document. They'll counter again, Seventh-day Adventists, but vicarious fili Dei can be found in Lucius Ferraris' book, Prompta Bibliotheca, which came, contains an instance of the title in question. And the answer to that is, yes, Lucius Ferraris, his work, Prompta Bibliotheca, con- contains the title in one of his writings, vicarious fili do- Dei. But again, when he uses that title, it's a, he's using it as a description of the role of the Pope. And again, he used it because he based whatever he was describing on the donation of Constantine, a bogus document. Scholars state that Lucius Ferraris could have been more careful in his use of sources, but nonetheless, this example can in no way be regarded as an instance of vicarious fili Dei being used in an official Catholic document. Also, when the Seventh-day Adventists quote the Catholic Encyclopedia article about Lucius Ferreris' use of vicarious fili Dei, what you'll notice when you read their, their literature, when they quote it, they only quote part of it. They skip the final statement of the quote. And this is what they skip. This supplement serves to keep up to date the work of Ferreris, which will ever remain a precious mine of information although it is sometimes possible to reproach the author with laxism, which means Lucius Ferreris could have done a better and more accurate job in communicating what he was trying to say. Now, you think, okay, that solves the problem about the myth of this, this myth, that we kind of, kind of uh, destroyed it. Unfortunately, the Seventh-day Adventists, they continue propagating this. But I want to tell them, look, if you really want to find out about this, why don't you go to the Catholic Encyclopedia, to the section on Pope, Primacy of Honor, Titles and Insignia. Under the subsection of Official Titles of the Pope, the phrase vicarious fili Dei is nowhere to be found because it is and has never been an official title of the Pope. One last thing they will uh, speak if you're ever talking to them. They'll say, yeah, but you know what? And sometimes other Protestant groups do this. They'll say, but this title was used in 1915 in an issue of our Sunday Visitor. And it claimed the papal mitre is inscribed with the title Vicarious Fili Dei. And it's emblazoned in diamonds. Well, that's been passed on. Uh, They've done an extensive record of that. They can't find that particular issue. But the president of our Sunday Visitor, he did write a letter to the head of the Seventh-day Adventist, and he basically explained that that 1950 issue that had that word in it, it was an unintentional, unfortunate error that the newspaper staffer made, and it should not be used as evidence to support their vicarious fili day. And also, as good as maybe the Sunday Visitor is, it is not an official Catholic document, huh? And what about the charge that the Pope is the beast of Revelation because it wears a crown? Because Revelation 13 says, The beast wears crowns and has blasphemous names written on his head. How do we answer that one? Well, this way. Since about 708, many popes have worn at non-liturgical ceremonies a very special papal crown called a tiara, huh? But this stylized kind of beehive-shaped papal crown of three diadems that we've come to know as the papal tiara 
that only started in the 14th century. And although it was customary for these tiaras to be kind of decorated, encrusted with jewels and other precious ornaments, there is no evidence. I'm talking about no statue, bust, painting, drawing, or even a written description of any of the many tiaras that were crafted that any papal tiara had the name or title of the Pope Felis Dei, uh, Felis, uh, uh, Vicarius Felis Dei emblazoned in jewels on it. That's significant because, you know, when you think through our history, and we're going to, as we continue Pope fiction in the next year, uh, it's significant because, you know, we know about a lot of the medieval and Renaissance popes who had extravagant tastes and were extra, uh, extravagantly van, vain, and they prompted them to have very lavishly or, ornamented, jeweled, encrusted tiaras made for them. And we possess paintings and statues and other representations that they wore these things. And if any pope would have worn one with that a title on it, it would have been one of these guys. But no pope did. You know, one particular anti-Catholic track shows a metal tiara with the title Vicarious Fili Dei written in diamonds across it. But the fact of the matter is it was a drawing. It wasn't a photograph. It wasn't a museum piece. It wasn't a photo of a painting or of a tiara. It was a drawing. Someone drew it. So the fact is, there is no historical evidence that a papal tiara had ever had the title of Vicarious Fili Dei emblazoned on it. One last thing. They're so insistent about using Roman numerals and calculating that Vicarious Fili Dei, not a papal title, does have the number 666. Therefore, the Pope and his successors are the beast, the Antichrist. Well, using that same math exercise that we did earlier, it is interesting to note that the name of the woman who started the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ellen Gould White, her name also adds up to 666. L, L, V, L, D, V, V, and I equals 666. Do you think maybe she could be the beast of Revelation? The third myth that we're going to talk about is connected to the book of Revelation. The myth, the whore of Babylon and the papacy. Myth goes this way. In the book of Revelation, the whore of Babylon is described as the city that sits on seven hills. Revelation 17.9. The seven-hilled city, obviously, is Rome, the headquarters of the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. It is clear, then, that the whore of Babylon in Scripture is Roman Catholicism and the papacy. Now, this myth traces all the way back to the Protestant Reformation. Many, many uh, writings, books, engravings have this myth. How do we go about looking at it? Well, first of all, you know, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to discount the truth. We, we, are, we are open to all truth. There is no denying that the city of Rome is famous for its seven hills. No question. But does that prove, then, it's the whore of Babylon? No. Why? Because there's problems with that. The first problem is linguistics. See, to begin with, this myth makes a huge and unfounded leap based on linguistics. The Greek word used in Revelation 17.9 is ore from the word dros. And in Scripture, oros usually means mountain, not a hill. I'm talking about a mountain, not little hills, a mountain. You'll see why this detail is real important in a moment. Now, the word mountain does not have to be taken literally. In fact, in the Bible, a mountain symbolizes different things. Obviously, you know, on the Mount of Transfiguration... It was a place where God manifested himself. And a mountain is where the Ten Commandments were given. But a mountain often symbolizes a kingdom. And the number seven in the ancient languages represents a perfect number, completeness or fullness. So, just taking the fact that when you say a seven hills, seven mountains can symbolize any number of things. It could symbolize one kingdom, it could symbolize all the power of the world. 
It could symbolize that the whore of Babylon reigns over all the kingdoms of earth. Therefore, just because Rome, like other famous cities, has been known for seven hills, that doesn't necessarily mean that St. John was speaking of the city of Rome in Revelation 17. He could, you think about it, he could have been referring to a city much closer to his own experience. Has anybody been to Jerusalem? Seven different kinds of hills around, mountains. He could be referring to that. Now the second problem with this myth is they equate Rome to Roman Catholicism and to the papacy. So let's presume that it is Rome about which St. John is speaking in the book of Revelation. The problem comes when uh, Protestant polemicists make the assumption that the city of Rome equates to Roman Catholicism and to the papacy. I'll tell you where we see this assumption. David Hunt wrote a book called A Woman Rides the Beast. And this is what he writes. Against only one other city in history could a charge of fornication be leveled. That city is Rome, and more specifically, Vatican City. It comes from page 69 of his book. David Hunt continues. Numerous churches, of course, are headquartered in cities, but only one city is the headquarters of a church. Vatican City is the heartbeat of the Roman Catholic Church and nothing else. That sounds pretty convincing. But what David Hunt fails to mention is the fact that Rome, the city of Rome, and Vatican City are two separate and distinct cities. You know, we do know that Vatican City is its own city state, you know, has it have its own money, its own post office, its own army. So the fundamental flaw with David Hunt's argument is the fact that while the city of Rome does sit on the famed seven hills, Vatican City does not. It sits on another hill called Vaticanus, or the Vatican Hill. Seven hills upon which Rome sits are the Quirinal, Aventine, Palatine, Capitoline, Chalian, Escaline, and Vimeo. And that's on one side of the Tiber River. The Tiber River forms a natural boundary for the city limits of ancient Rome. The seven hills were on one side, snug inside the city walls. Vatican City, the Catholic Church headquarters, is not built on those seven hills or within the walls of ancient Rome. It sits across the Tiber River on another hill, Vatican Hill. Therefore, since St. Peter's Basilica and Vatican City do not sit on one of the seven hills of Rome, well, this would seem to eliminate Vatican City as a candidate for being the whore of Babylon. And also, you can't jump and equate Rome with Roman Catholicism. It's another leap that is not, uh, not equates. Then some Protestant polemicists, desperate to, sol- uh, to salvage the argument, they came, wait, 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 though, but the cathedral church in the official seat of the bishop of Rome is St. John Lateran, which, by the way, it is. A lot of people say, think uh, the Pope's church is St. Peter's, uh uh-uh. The Pope's parish church is St. John Lateran, the mother and head church of all Christianity. November 9th is a feast of St. John Lateran. That's what's proclaimed. Caput in Mater, the head and mother church of all Christianity, the source of unity. That's the Pope's church. So, oh my gosh, they got me there then, huh? Because St. John Lateran does fall within the bounds of old Rome on the seven hills. The Catholic Church still fits the bill as being based in Rome and therefore the whore of Babylon. I always tell people, boy, you got to give these people an A-plus for effort. It is true that St. John Lateran Basilica is the Pope's parish church, and it's located in old Rome on one of the seven hills. The problem with the argument is this, is that a cathedral is a church building, not a city. And the whore of Babylon is clearly, in Revelation 17, 18, it's clearly a city. You can't mix and match biblical symbols to make them fit your own personal interpretation. That does violence to the text. And of course, even if this last claim still fails, if you make this claim, it still fails to account for the leap from a city to a religion. 
which the identification of Catholicism with the Horb of Babylon must make for it to work. So therefore, the theory that the location of St. John Lateran and the Pope's parish church is the Whore of Babylon, it fails. Clearly, the Whore of Babylon refers to a city, not a church or cathedral. So the ultimate conclusion about this myth is the city of Rome could be the great Whore of Revelation, but so could the city of Jerusalem or many other cities or kingdoms in the world. And even if the Whore of Babylon refers to Rome, Rome does not equate to Roman Catholicism. They're two separate entities. Rome's over there, the Vatican headquarters, the head of, uh, and the, the symbol of all Catholicism is over across the river. St. John Lateran is a cathedral, not a city. The Whore of Babylon refers to a city. Therefore, the Whore of Babylon is not, cannot be the papacy or Roman Catholicism. The fourth myth we're going to cover tonight is called the myth that St. Peter never went to Rome, so the bishop of Rome cannot be the successor to St. Peter. Here's how the myth goes. The bishop of Rome cannot be the successor to Peter since Peter was never in Rome. Nowhere does the Bible say that Peter went to, there, went to Rome. And St. Paul, who did go there, never mentions Peter being in Rome, not even in his letter to the Romans. You'd think he would say it, huh? If Peter were the Pope, he certainly would have mentioned that he was in Rome. How do we look at this myth? Well, the fact is, the Bible doesn't say Peter went to Rome and died there. But because the Bible doesn't say that, it doesn't mean that Peter didn't go there to Rome and didn't die there. See, trying to prove that Peter did not go to Rome and die there is a lot like trying to prove that St. Mark did not write the Gospel of Mark. That gospel, like Matthew and Luke, they're written by anonymous writers with no mention of the author's identity. But that shouldn't trouble us, you see, because the external evidence, not to mention the internal linguistic evidence, and the testimony of the early church overwhelmingly corroborates the claim that Mark wrote the gospel attributed to him. So it's true that the Bible does not explicitly say that St. Peter went to Rome. <clears throat> but that shouldn't trouble us either, because its surrounding historical evidence is more than sufficient to prove that he did. Let's look at the thing that there's no evidence that Peter didn't go to Rome. Well, if Peter didn't go to Rome, where did he go? Where did he die? I mean, you would expect that this was the first of the apostles, the first pope, you'd expect to find plenty of evidence in the writings of the early church fathers and the early church telling us where this very prominent apostle carried out his final years of ministry if it were in some other place than Rome. No historical record offers any hint that St. Peter ended his days anywhere else than in Rome. No other city except Rome ever claimed to possess the site of his martyrdom or his tombs. And by the way, you got to know that early Christians were extraordinarily diligent about making and proving such claims. No other city, even Antioch, where St. Peter resided for some time during his apostolate, no other city claimed that Peter ended his days there. No church father or church council or any other early church record indicates that he finished his days anywhere else but in Rome. So that's kind of the looking at the lack of evidence side of the coin. The flip side is the mountain of evidence proving that St. Peter did go to Rome. Everyone, everywhere in the early church agreed that Peter went to Rome, ministered there for over two decades, suffered a martyrdom there by being crucified upside down in 65 or so A.D. during the persecution of Emperor Nero. Now, why didn't St. Paul mention him in his letters? I remember uh, I was listening to Carl Keating. He's written a wonderful book. You should have it on your shelf. It's called Catholicism and Fundamentalism. And it's his response to a lot of the, some of these myths and other uh, attacks on the church. And I remember we were listening one time to a, um, to a debate that he had with the, the leader of the Baptist church. 
And it was down in the Baptist church area. Uh, and the first guy that got up went on to this. Peter never went to Rome. He never was there in Rome. And meanwhile, the crowds in a fear, you know, just it's like a, at, a, at a football game, cheering their team on. That's right, you tell them. He never went to Rome. He's never, and by the way, St. Paul didn't even mention him. If he was in Rome, he wrote a letter to the Romans. You'd think he'd mention it. <sighs> Cheering. And Carl Keaty is kind of like Mr. Peabody, really low key. And he walks up to the microphone. <clears throat> Perhaps he wasn't there that day when he wrote the letter. Oh, my goodness, the whole place erupted in laughter, which, by the way, is a good way, a good tool to have when you're talking to people about these things. Have a good sense of humor. Don't try to pile drive people into the ground. State your point. Use a little bit of humor. And Carl Keating followed up by saying, hey, look, these guys were missionaries. They wandered all around the known world, through the Middle East and the great cities there. So the fact that uh, it's not mentioned explicitly doesn't mean anything. It means that Paul could have written before Peter arrived. But it doesn't mean that Peter never arrived and never was there. Also, given the hostile uh, government that controlled the known world at that time, the grave danger to all Christians, the fact that St. Paul didn't mention Peter's name or his whereabouts in the letters well, that would make sense. He didn't want to draw unfriendly attention to somebody. It's also, as I mentioned, possible that Peter had not arrived at the time when Paul wrote his letter. But we even see St. Peter making what seems to be a cryptic reference to his presence in Rome when he says this in 1 Peter 5.13. The chosen one at Babylon sends your greetings as does Mark, my son. Two hints there. Babylon was a commonly used code word for Rome among Christians. Why? Because of its pagan decadence and opposition to Christ. To them, it reminded them of the idolatrous wickedness associated with the ancient city and civilization of Babylon. Also, Mark, we do know that Mark journeyed with Peter in his apostolic journeys and was a friend. And many people think Mark was kind of uh, a secretary to Peter, writing as a scribe, his letters for him. So there's a couple hints there. But the fact of the matter, once St. Peter had been martyred, many testimonies of his sojourn in Rome and uh, with St. Paul, they poured forth in a flood from early Christian writers. Perhaps the most detailed of these were the early accounts that came from St. Irenaeus of Lyon. He died about the year 200. He wrote a book against Gnosticism called Against Heresies. And in this book, he gave a detailed account of the succession of the bishops of Rome from St. Peter right down to his own day, 200 years. So what's that? It's 140 years since uh, the time Peter died. St. Irenaeus also referred to Rome as the city where Peter and Paul proclaimed the gospel and founded the church. Other early examples of people mentioning this was St. Ignatius of Antioch who referred to the church at Rome as the church of Peter and Paul. It was in his letter to the Romans. St. Cyprian, in his epistle, number 52, he described Rome as the place of Peter. Now, uh, Antioch lived in the year, he died in 107, so you see the closeness here. Cyprian died in 251. St. Jerome, who, who died in 420, he called Rome the See of Peter in his epistle to Pope Damasus. And around the year A.D. 166, Bishop Dionysus of Corinth wrote to Pope Soter. He writes this, You all have also by your very admonition brought together the planting that was made by Peter and Paul at Rome. Also, you know, there's a wonderful letter written by, and I, I'm drawing a blank. He was writing to a friend who lived in Alexandria, which was one of the great Christian centers of the ancient world. And he was writing, he said he acknowledged that Alexandria was a very famous thing, but Rome was the center of the church. And in basic in the letter, he said, if you come here, I will show you the tombs of both of them. We have the tombs. This was written in uh, in the third century. So there was a great evidence all the way through. And there's also great archaeological evidence. Besides the vast amount of historical evidence showing that Peter went to Rome, 
modern archaeology has offered even more credible evidence. I'm, I'm fascinated by this, and it'll be part of, I think, another talk I'll do, but uh, you can go to a book called The Bones of St. Peter by John Evangelist Walsh, or another book by um, John O'Neill called The Tomb of the Fisherman. John Evangelist Walsh is a little bit bigger book like this. The other one's a smaller one, very easy to read, but they tell the fascinating story about how they found the tomb of Peter and how all this scientific evidence and archaeological evidence and forensic evidence has pointed that what was said that Peter was buried right below the main altar of St. Peter. You draw a drop line from the center of the dome straight down. It'll go right through the main altar, right down to the tomb of Peter. And in 1941, Pope Pius XII commissioned a group of archaeologists secretly, because remember, the Nazis were controlling Italy at that time, commissioned archaeologists to go down deep under St. Peter's, down about 60 feet, and start excavating. And the reason for it is that Pope Pius XI had died, and they were, Pope Pius XI wanted to be buried in the crypt underneath the main sanctuary of St. Peter. So if you ever go to St. Rome, you can go down into the crypt, you'll see several tombs of the popes down there. And he wanted to be buried there, but the place he wanted to be buried had very low ceilings, so they were digging away, and all of a sudden, whoosh, one of the grounds keepers fell right through and went down, and he fell into this ancient mausoleum. He was terrified out of his mind. People said, hold on, we want to send you, why don't you look down there? Yeah. So they handed him a, a, a light, and he fell into this unbelievably beautifully decorated mausoleum. And, uh, and he looked around. And so they reported this to Pope Pius XII, and he made a decision to go and excavate. First, he had the archaeologists go to the Vatican archives. Over beyond St. Peter to, if you're looking at it to the right, the Vatican archives go way down under St. Saint, under Saint, uh, uh, Vatican City. There's 91 miles of shell space with all these ancient records. I had the blessing to go under there and to see some of these documents. And he sent the archaeologists down there to study. And recorded in history were several times that they broke through. Now why? Because you've got to remember, Rome fell in the 5th century, huh? The late to fourth, early 4th century. It fell. All the barbarians, the tribes came in, conquered them. And what had happened was they destroyed some of the churches above, but when Constantine became emperor, he wanted to build a church in memory of St. Peter, and so he literally went to the pagan cemetery, to the place where he was, and he designed the, his basilica to sit right over the tomb of Peter. And to do it, he had to cut off the tops of these mausoleums. He packed them full of dirt. They became kind of foundation stones for his cathedral. And he moved literally the Vatican Hill over on top of it to provide the flat foundation for the new basilica. Well, when the barbarians came later on in the fourth century, or fifth century, all that was covered up. The barbarians couldn't, they destroyed things above, but they did, all this was preserved quite pristinely down below. So they, the archaeologists studied, they went down, they started going one direction, they found out we can't go that way because one of the supporting walls of the big basilica of St. Peter, the new one built in the 1500s, would come tumbling down. So they had to go back around. They started following the clues. The clues said that uh, they would come to a red wall. They found the red wall, a retaining wall. Everything fit to all the things. And eventually, they would find these bones. I won't go through the whole thing because I want you to read the book. They find the bones. What happened was they were, they were not part of the actual tomb of Peter. Peter's tomb was here. There was a red wall, and into the wall was a repository. And literally, one worker had pulled out these bones, put them in a box. They sat into a, in a shed, literally, in, down below. Not known to the archaeologists. It was only later that when this woman, who's kind of the hero of the story, Margarita Guarducci, she was an expert on ancient graffiti. And she was studying all this graffiti that was cut into the wall by Christians and she'd tell them what it meant and everything was kept pointing here's the tomb of Peter and she happened to ask a question of one of the groundskeepers 
hey, do you have any more examples of this graffiti? Oh, yes, there was a piece that came right from this part, this wall here, this, this little aperture, and a piece fell out, and there were some bones. She said, bones? So she went, they found the bones. She put them to a forensic, uh, a forensic scientist, a doctor, who specialized in ancient uh, skeletons. And she herself took the, the words that were scraped, and it was said on that piece of stone that had fallen off the wall, Petrus Aeni, which is Greek means Peter's in here. She couldn't believe it. So they, she gave these bones, didn't tell the doctor, the forensic uh, archaeologist, where she found them. She said, I want you to study them. Several years went by, the, the report came out saying the following things that it was a powerfully built man, an elderly man, about 65 years of age of the first century, who died of crucifixion. He had overly developed forearms, and the forensic man said either he was a farmer or a fisherman. Margarita Graduci said, how can you tell that? He said, because farmers and fishermen have overdeveloped forearms because of the tremendous pulling like, and pushing that farmers have to do. And he said, but I bet this is a fisherman because they had to have extraordinary strength to pull up those wet nets, you know, heavy nets with fish in it. He said he's a first century man, about 65 years of age, a fisherman, I believe, strong. He said uh, there were no feet bones. Well, that would make sense. Because why? Well, he was crucified upside down. Probably the Christians bribed a Roman soldier. He took out his sword and probably just hacked away at the ankles and they carved his body away. But there are no feet bones. But in the examination, there is first century soil attached to the bones. And even more incredibly, the, test, the records show that he, his, these bones, when they were first placed there by Constantine, had been wrapped in royal purple cloth. Remember, the purple was the color and the dye of the emperor. No one could have it but the emperor. He was wrapped in that. And, and the forensic studies show that these bones have the stain of this purple dye that goes all the way back. Now, you get to see the whole story. It's incredibly told, like a mystery story by John Evangelist Walsh in the bones of St. Peter. But science can only go so far. It doesn't prove that it's St. Peter there, but all the records say he was buried here. All the historical records, archaeological records, and scientific things says this is really him. That's as far as we can go. But everything fits in it. Everything fits. That here is where he was buried. And so we, we have firm confidence that is the place of Peter because it's right exactly where he said. In fact, when you, if you ever get to Rome, I suggest you have to go online. Get reservations for the Scavi tour because very few people go on this tour. They go to St. Peter's and St. John Lateran and St. Mary Major. But they don't go to Scavi because only, they only take 11 people on each tour. Okay, 11 people. And they only offer like two a day. So you go online, you can sign up, but it's the most fascinating tour. It's one of the best tours I've ever been on because you literally go down way under St. Peter's and you're walking th on the first century level ground down the street. You're going by one mausoleum after another and you're looking in and they show all these things and they say, look, in this mausoleum, you know that this was a Christian family. How? Look how they painted the sun god. Normally he's just painted with a, 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 a halo around his head. This one had a cross. He said, we know that this was a, a, a Roman who was a Christian. And, and the guy that fell through, remember I told the guy he fell through in 1941? He missed the painting by that much. <laughs> if he went over a little bit farther, he would have destroyed the painting. But it stands there. And um, you go around, you walk around, and they take you to where they find the red wall, and they show you, you can see the actual, there was like one tomb encased by another tomb over the centuries, and you see the different layers of the tomb, and then finally you'll see his, his bones, they were placed in a, an acrylic box, now they're just back into a, uh, a kind of a gold box, but you can actually see it. And that gold box backs up to the Clementine Chapel. So if you ever get the privilege of having Mass at the Clementine Chapel, it's the chapel closest to the bones of Peter. I had friends that just came back from that. I suggest you go on that tour if you ever go to Rome. Make sure you get to that because it is so fascinating. It's like you're walking down a movie set. But you see, everything points to the fact that Peter literally went to Rome, 
crucified upside down as he asked because he felt he could not be crucified like his Savior. And he worked two decades there, was arrested during the persecution of Nero. He was crucified. Most likely, his feet were cut off, bribed the Roman, dragged him. He was pay, pay, buried first in a pagan cemetery right next to the circus Nero. It was a big circus. Circus Maximus is over that way a little bit. This is closer to the Vatican. It used to run the games and the chariots there, buried in a pagan cemetery next to it. As persecutions began to lessen, Christians bought up more property around the tomb of Peter. And we see on these ancient tombs very direct signs. You'll see a cross and a, a, like an arrow, P to cross, it says from Peter to Jesus. You know, this is the connection, you see. You see all these great signs there. So he, he was there, and then uh, he was taken out uh, at, at the time of the uh, barbarian invasion. Peter's bones, along with Paul's, were taken to the uh, catacombs of St. Sebastian, right along the Via Appia Attica. And they were there, and then they were brought back in the 6th century. And most scholars who study this believe that what they did is they did a fake out. They put three or four bodies in Peter's tomb. And then over here on the red wall, they created a, uh, a, a little enclosure. They put the bones there, sealed it up. So if people came to desecrate Peter's tombs, they would just get Christians, men and women. They found like three men, I think, and a woman in that tomb. The, 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 what they thought was a tomb of Peter. But over here, that's where it said Peter's in here. And they probably did that probably for the future that no one had ever desecrate the, the tomb of Peter. But his bones were there and they were brought back in the 6th century and interred to where they are now. And they're still in that stone ossuary about 30, maybe 30, 40 feet below the main altar. Like I said, get John Evangelist Walsh's book, The Bones of Peter, or John O'Neill's book, The Tomb of the Fisherman. They're a fascinating read. One extra point is that... Um, I was stunned because I didn't know this, but John O'Neill says Pius XII sent one of his monsignors here to, to the United States to a wonderful Catholic man named Robert Strake. He was a tremendous businessman, born in utter poverty, but helped by the church, always grateful to his faith in his church, became a, one of the wealthiest men through, uh, he was a wildcatter. He found one of the biggest deposits of oil in Texas. But he literally gave almost everything to the service of the church. And Pius XII sent his man over to ask him, would you fund this? And he gave him a blank check. And they estimate probably it was about worth about the whole effort, about five or six million way back in 1940, which would be tens of millions today. And he did it freely. And he didn't take any credit for it. But we owe a lot to him because that's how we found it. So therefore, all this evidence, you see, corroborates the constant tradition of the church and the unanimous testimony of the early fathers that Peter did go to Rome. He labored there for two decades, died a martyr's death, was buried exactly where Constantine said he buried him, and the evidence all seems to point there. Amen. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming.